I would like to welcome everybody to today's Lunch and Learn webinar from CSO Hymns. Before I turn it over to Dr. Lai, I would like to uh, share a little bit of information on the Central and Southern Ohio Hymns chapter, some of our upcoming events, and uh, some of our contact information in case you'd like to get in touch with us. Uh, also, this session is being recorded. A link to the recording will be posted on the CSO Hymns website. Also, the handouts are available from within the GoToWebinar app right now, or again, they will be uh, posted on our CSO Hymns website here in the next day or two. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, Share kind of covered this information already. Uh, we do provide CEUs for the CA HIMS and CP HIMS certification. So if you have those certifications, you, you will receive one CEU for today's presentation. Um, the CSO HIMS website is available as, at csohio.himschapter.org. You can find all of the information from our past and future events. Uh, you can get in contact with our board members and kind of see what we're all about. If you would like to email us, uh, the email address is rcsohio.president at hymnschapter.org. Those emails will go to me. My name is Scott Mash, and this year I am serving as the Central and Southern Ohio uh, Hymns Chapter President. If you email csohio.info at hymnschapter.org, that goes to a subset of our board members. We're also uh, pretty active on social media. We have uh, Facebook and Twitter if you just look for CSO Hands, and we're also on LinkedIn. We do use our uh, social media to kind of share little articles we find interesting and also really to share a lot of information about our, our upcoming events. We could not do what we do without our sponsors, so I would like to take the time to uh, thank our, our current sponsors. Our, our premier level sponsors, these are our, our top level financial sponsors and you just want to thank them for, you know, not only their support but also in helping us uh, provide you, our, our members, with these educational opportunities. Our uh, first premier level sponsors cover my meds. You can find them at www.covermymeds.com, expedient at, at expedient.com, and ahead at thinkahead.com. Those are our premier, our top level sponsors. Our elite level sponsors are Metasource, Blue Orange Compliance, Tech Systems, Data Gravity, Lidos, and Time Warner Business Class. And you know, at any time that any of our members have the opportunity to work with these sponsors, we would, we would much appreciate that. We do have a number of uh, upcoming events. Uh, the one of our we, we we have three big events each year. One of those is our annual Ohio Health Information Technology Day. This is an advocacy day event that we run at the Ohio State House every year. This year it will be on Wednesday, April 27th. Our registration site is not open yet, so if you look for uh, just keep an eye on our the csohio.hymnschapter.org website for more information as this develops. Our next big event will be our spring conference, which is we're calling the Hacker's Guide to Hacking Healthcare, Healthcare, the conference on privacy and cybersecurity that you just can't miss. This event will be up in Dublin. It's going to be at the conference center at OCLC. Our registration site is open, and we're working to finalize the um, the agenda. We have great speakers. We have great breakout sessions. Um, this is going to be uh, this is going to be our, one of our biggest conferences that we ever had. We're really excited about this. Please get registered. Th this registration link again it will be in the handouts, but it's also active on the uh, CS uh, OHEMS website. These lunch and learn webinars are going to continue. They're going to be a monthly thing. We either run them on the second or third week of the month, depending on if there's a holiday and whatnot. So. Uh, the next one will be March 9th, which is going to cover the Notice Act. The presenter is going to be Tim Kelly from Standard Register. Our April Lunch and Learn is going to be the ABCs of Tiger in the Virtual Learning Environment. It will be Taria Shaw from HIMSS and Victoria Wangia Anderson from the University of Cincinnati. In May, our Lunch and Learn will be developing your brand, recruiting considerations, and other items to consider as you transition into HIT roles. Lisa Cannon, who is one of our board members, will be the presenter, and she also works for the Chartist Group. 
we do have a couple slots to fill. So if you have uh, some information to share, if you if you are you consider yourself to be a guru or an expert in any HIT, any healthcare IT related topic, and would love to share uh, what you're doing with the rest of the CSO him CSO hims members, please 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 contact me. Um, we're working real hard to get these filled out. We want to make this an ongoing thing every month to provide educational opportunities to our members. Another thing we're really excited about is we're bringing the CA HEMS and the CP HEMS prep course and exam to Ohio. The CA HEMS prep course and exam will be on Thursday, April 14th from 8 to 3. You can take the prep course. And then at 3 o'clock, you can go right into the exam. Now, you don't necessarily need to take the prep course to take the exam. You can just sign up for the exam, or you can sign up for the prep course, or you can sign up for both. Um, there are only 25 seats available for the prep course. We can hold up to 50 for the exam. I would like to thank Cover My Meds because they are actually serving as our sponsor and host for this event. Uh, we're going to hold this at their offices, so they're providing us the space. You have to register separately because the prep course we handle at the chapter level, the exam, you have to apply for the exam through National HIMSS. The CP HIMSS review course and exam will be held the next day. It will be held Friday, April 15th. Again, 8 to 3 for the prep course, 3 to 5 for the exam. Uh, one thing we are doing as a chapter if you take both the prep course and the exam, and you're a member of CSO HIMS, and you pass the exam, if you're taking the CP HIMS, we're going to give you back $50. If you are taking the CA HIMS and you're successful, we're going to give you back $25 of your of your um, $150 for the prep course. So, you know, we're just trying to find a way to uh, to uh, further encourage our members to pursue the CP HIMS and the CA HIMS certification. Another thing that we are doing is we are hosting a luncheon at HIMSS. So if you're going to HIMSS National in Vegas and uh, you just need some time away, join us on Tuesday, March 1st. We're going to be in the Bellini Room, uh, room 2005, from noon to 1. The cost is only $10 for you if you're a member of the CSO HIMSS chapter. Looks like we're having some audio problems. So I apologize if you didn't hear us there for a little bit. Hoping that you can hear us now. I'm trying to find, okay, looks like audio is back on. I apologize, I'm off site today. And, and so we have some technical challenges. So at any rate, join us at our luncheon at HIMS. $10 for, non, for members, $75 for non-members. The reason the cost seems so high is uh, the food costs out in Vegas are extremely, extremely high. So we have to... We do have to charge our the non-members who are in attendance. Pre-registration is required. Last thing we'd like to share information about is one of our partner organizations here in Ohio. We work a lot with OHEMA. They have a trade show coming up in March uh, from the 7th, 7th to the 9th. I would strongly encourage that um, you attend. Um, great subject matter. Great. They have a great program. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lai. Going to make him the presenter. Dr. Lai, you are unmuted and the floor is yours. Hello? Ah, we can hear you. All right, that's great. And your screen is showing up. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm Albert Lai. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedical Informatics at The Ohio State University and the Associate Chief Research Information Officer uh, for the Wexner Medical Center, so I'm a bit of a data geek. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of data analytics. Um, First, uh, I guess instead of looking for gold, we're going to be digging for uh, health information in, uh, in a bunch of uh, EHRs. Um, so first question is, what is data analytics? Um, so data analytics uh, is discovering associations and understanding patterns and trends within data. Uh, and uh, it frequently uses um, 
machine learning or statistical methods. Uh, it is the science of examining raw data uh, with the purpose of drawing conclusions about that information and also taking that data and turning it into actionable information to support strategic and tactical decision making. So there are a number of different things uh, that occur in the process. Um, and there's some debate about what the individual components of uh, the process of data analytics are, but typically we go through this uh, process of what we call the um, DIKW, or uh, period of, Pyramid of Knowledge. Um, so the D stands for data, sorry, DIKW stands for data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Uh, the most common one you'll see is, DI, um, is this DIKW breakdown. Uh, and if you look at, uh, let's look at the, each of these uh, components. So data are facts about the world. For example, in our case, uh, in our EHR, we might have that uh, Pam is five foot tall, has brown hair and blue eyes. Uh, data are things that we can perceive through our senses, right? Information is data that has meaning. Uh, and so when we listen to a heartbeat, we know that the, you know, we know those, those noises are a heartbeat. That's sort of information. Um, knowledge is understanding patterns. And wisdom is able to take that uh, knowledge and turn it into um, the ability to increase effectiveness or uh, applying knowledge uh, requiring judgment. So now when we talk about data analytics, uh, we really typically only see um, the, you know, the top half of the iceberg or actually really the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's really a lot of uh, other things that underlie uh, the process of data analytics. Um, some of these uh, processes include uh, a lot of work in getting the data from clinical and financial administrative systems, uh, also a lot of data cleaning and, and, and a lot of data warehousing activities uh, and data governance activities. And I'll talk about each one of these uh, or most of these. So before we get into that, what, is, what can I do with data analytics? Uh, so here's the good part. Uh, we can address things like waste uh, and care variability. Uh, we can assist with population management, population health management. Uh, we can do a lot of quality improvement initiatives, like for example, um, optimization of prescription of, uh, of antibiotics as an example. Uh, we can do a lot of cost containment procedures, and we can get into predictive analytics and uh, attempt to uh, somewhat predict the future uh, and, and thereby optimizing care. So why do I care about data analytics? Uh, right now, uh, there's not a lot being done out there, but uh, if you do uh, use data analytics approaches, uh, one can uh, achieve or maintain a competitive edge, and also uh, you can address the Institute for uh, healthcare improvement, or IHI triple aim of improving patient care, including uh, quality and satisfaction while improving the uh, health of populations while also reducing the cost uh, per capita. So here are some common healthcare applications of data analytics. Uh, quality improvement is a big one. Uh, syndromic surveillance uh, is also a fairly large one. Uh, Recently, there's been a, a lot of uh, work in understanding the, the readmission patterns of various uh, diseases, uh, particularly surrounding, for example, heart failure. Uh, there's a lot of uh, questions regarding length of stay analysis, which people have been doing over the, over the last uh, decade, as well as, uh, in more recent times, predictive modeling. Uh, just as some examples of some things that I've had some experience with in analytics, uh, you know, the some of the ones that I've uh, been involved with over the years have been, uh, you know, a collaborative uh, effort with uh, between OSU and uh, um, OSU and Battelle um, in, with regards to acute kidney injury, uh, and also looking at. Uh, antimicrobial stewardship in terms of optimizing antimicrobial antibiotics and 
uh, enforcing the optimal use of those antibiotics and looking at the changes in the number of days that antibiotics are used and the cost of their use. Uh, so I, I'm going to be drawing on some of this experience uh, for uh, uh, the lessons learned for, uh, through, uh, for the rest of my talk here. So what is the, now well, we talked about what is data analytics, how does one go about doing data, data analytics? Typically, this involves inspecting the data, cleaning the data, transforming the data, and then modeling the data for the purposes of discovering useful information for uh, decision making. Now, when doing data analytics, uh, you have to pretty much take your transactional database and turn it into a data warehouse. So what do I mean by that? Uh, and transactional databases are typically what your EHR is sitting on. Uh, data warehouse is typically an extract of that information and transforms it into a way of looking at uh, the data that is different. Uh, and for example, uh, in a transactional database, uh, we're storing uh, our live EHR data, and it's really uh, organized there for uh, good read and write operations on individual data uh, and is usually in a patient stored in a patient oriented manner right with the data warehouse on the other hand you're really optimizing it for large data sets and is looked at uh, in a more subject oriented manner and typically we want to uh, integrate data from many data, different data sources and combine it in a way that makes sense for the purposes of an analysis of the data. Another way in which they differ is that um, in the way that the data of the, the data in these in transactional databases and data warehouses uh, are stored, many times uh, in a transactional database uh, the, we have many complex table structures that require lots and lots of joins. Um, and the data can be uh, stored in a normalized manner, meaning that there is typically no duplicate data in the in the transactional databases or in our in our EHRs. Um, and these transactional databases, as many of you are well aware, require basically 100% uptime, and that you want them to update in real time. Now, data warehouses are structured a little little bit differently in that they are organized to facilitate reporting. And you know, while sometimes you can get some quick transactions on them, really you're, they're designed to facilitate large data transactions and not interactive uh, transactions. And they're typically much simpler in terms of their uh, data structures and uh, in terms of their availability. Uh, if your data warehouse goes down, it's not as big a deal, and you know it can be flexible depending on your needs. And frequently, these things are not updated in real time; they're updated you know, every 24 hours or weekly, depending on the organizational needs or content needs for a specific area. Sorry about that. Um, so, in terms of Finding and cleaning data for analytics, uh, there are a number of challenges. Uh, for example, data may be in the electronic health record uh, because providers have put it in there, but it's frequently not in a readily usable format. Also, you know, one thing that many clinicians have, uh, have trouble with understanding, and I'm sure all of you understand this, is that just because it's been scanned into the system, doesn't mean that uh, you can actually get access to it, and therefore, you know, data or frequently in PDF files, or it came in as a fax and got scanned into the system. Uh, so that's probably the worst case, uh, in which people think, well, the data is in the EHR, why can't we get access to it and do some analysis on it? Uh, the other case is that, um, you know, let's say a clinician typed it into the system, right? Now, you would think it would be easy to find that information, but sometimes it's that even that can be challenging. Uh, you know, or, you know, if it, and that's the case in you know, one case where it's unstructured text, but what if it's in a coded structured field? It can, that can still be uh, a bit challenging. Now, in order to be successful with all this, you know, with all the, you know, all the challenges that I just mentioned, uh, one really needs to have a champion. And 
hospital leadership, you know, what really likes the, you know, idea that we're going to do analytics uh, to optimize our competitive edge, right? Now, what I've found in the past is that frequently stakeholders, you know, the boots on the ground are not as, um, they don't understand the, the need for it as much. And also, a lot of times, you know, to optimize data analytics, sometimes things need to be changed, uh, you know, in the, in the clinic. Uh, for example, we need to capture more structured data, and that changes uh, changes uh, things for the stakeholders uh, who are on their day to day. And um, so, and then sometimes, a lot of times, uh, some of these ideas that are come come about with uh, trying to say, well, if we document some additional information, or we have these new algorithms that help us predict who uh, we need to spend our time with, uh, they're, they're not, they haven't been proved proven for our clinical effectiveness yet. So that can be um, more, can be challenging in terms of trying to get individual stakeholders on board. Um, but uh, ideally, if you can find yourself a champion, then uh, that can make things go a lot easier. Now, there are a variety of challenges because we are now dealing with secondary use data, typically. Uh, that meaning, for secondary use means that the data usage is not for the purposes in which it was originally collected. So therefore, we will have to clean the data in order to uh, get to the data that we want. Um, a lot of times there are errors or, mess, you know, or not as clean data as we would like. Um, so we will have to go through and try to identify the correct data that's there. Uh, a lot of times it's, easy, it's challenging to find the data that we were wanting to use. Um, or trying trying to find the right data rather than what is easy to obtain. Uh, sometimes uh, another challenge is that in truth, data is really collected for billing purposes and not for the purposes of clinical care. Um, despite that, you know, really it's supposed to be an electronic health record. Uh, much of it is used really for billing. And there's this big challenge between what's structured and unstructured data. Uh, clinicians tend to like to write. Uh, unstructured narratives or, you know, for their reports. Uh, they don't like to just be data entry people. Uh, they like to, you know, be able to express uh, their clinical judgment. And uh, sometimes data is going to be structured and sometimes it's going to be unstructured because of that. Uh, and while that's great that they have these narratives, sometimes some of the data that you expect to be structured uh, frequently is not. Uh, so, for example, we've discovered in our system that ejection fractions tend to be written in the notes rather than um, being in a structured data field somewhere. So sometimes you have to fight with that in order to extract the correct piece of data that you are looking for. Another aspect that's important is data provenance. So what do I mean by data provenance? The data provenance covers the idea that there is the correct one source that you want to get data from. Uh, this is particularly challenging for people with best of breed systems. So, for example, if you have an emission system which is somewhat separate from your EHR uh, and that they are interfaced together. Um, so, for simple things like that, how would you actually calculate your census for a given day? Uh, you would think that everything is synchronized together, but in fact, in many cases, um, the data stored in each system is slightly different. Uh, so, you need to be able to define what's the correct data source for each individual data point that you're looking for. Uh, and you need to define a consistent way of doing this for every analysis. And that's fairly challenging because frequently there are multiple stakeholders involved uh, and they have been, you know, they have, have systems they use that are different from each other. And so therefore they may think that one system is more appropriate than another. But as an organization, uh, one really needs to find uh, what what's the correct data source for, for a given uh, piece of data. Also, we find that we have challenges with having multiple data analysts because there's usually not just one person supplying data for these things. Uh, they frequently have, uh, we've discovered that many of them have their own way of running queries and finding this information, which uh, can be problematic as well. So uh, this can be a really tough nut to crack. And uh, ideally, uh, one should establish this consistency with regards to uh, the correct uh, numbers for uh, for each piece of data. Now, something that we've encountered is that 
uh, data can frequently be input into many locations in an EHR. Uh, and one would think that uh, for structured data, this would be, uh, means that you know when we put it in there, it all ends up in the same place. But what we found is that some cases, you know, some cases, let's say there's two forms that have been generated, uh, and they go to different places in the back end. So uh, even though they may even contain the same data. So in this case, I have an example of two different variations on a blood pressure and temperature form. Uh, this is slightly contrived, but you know, there's one's uh, listed vertically, and the other one's listed horizontally. Uh, but conceivably, uh, they would end up in two different tables in the electronic health record, uh, despite the fact that they really talk about the same thing. Uh, and therefore, when it comes time to do your data analysis, you have to track down uh, all these different locations and potentially combine them. Uh, so that's also another challenge that we've run into in the past as well. So now that all the data is in there, uh, a lot of times you need to make data requests to get it back out. And so one of the things that we've identified is that it can take a long time to get your data. Uh, these information warehouse analysts are frequently very busy with a bunch of different requests. Uh, in comparison to many requests that they get, analytics requests tend to be much more complicated. Um, what we find is that uh, identifying the right data, element, data elements can be more time consuming and frequently with data analytics requests we're asking for a large number of data elements um, and defining the business logic for each one of those elements can be challenging. And that we've, what we have found also is that clinical data analytics is very different from uh, business and uh, financial type analytics. One of the challenges that we have found uh, with clinical data analytics is an understanding of the clinical domain uh, that makes it more challenging than, uh, than with respect to business and financial analytics. Uh, part of that has to do with an understanding of the clinical environment rather than, uh, uh, than which seems to require much more in-depth uh, knowledge than uh, performing many of these business and financial analytics that uh, have been traditionally performed. Now, once you get your data, there's still a lot of work that you need to do uh, in terms of data cleaning. Um, for example, uh, there's a number of things regarding uh, trying to do uh, record matching uh, and deduplication of data. So um, I will you know, discuss uh, some of the, of the work in terms of uh, some of that uh, in the next slide. Uh, also, uh, one needs to do frequently some spell checking. Uh, one also needs to look at the, you know, what are, what, what are appropriate values uh, within our data and uh, look at uh, unit consistency, particularly for combining data across multiple tables. Uh, what we found, uh, for example, is sometimes weight is stored in ounces and sometimes it's stored in kilograms and pounds. Uh, and so one needs to find ways to convert all that into a consistent uh, unit. Now, there becomes a question with regards to removing problematic data. So frequently one wants to re remove duplicates and you need to remove invalid entries, but there are some questions about re the removal of these uh, and you need to understand when you remove these what that really means. So for example, when you have some entries that seem to be out of range or empty or you know there's a zero, uh, is that really invalid data or is it data in which you you know need to understand what causes that value you know, specifically? And also when you remove that, is there gonna, is that going to result in a systematic bias to your analysis? Uh, because that zero or no may actually mean something in the system. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't really understand is that when you do data analytics, frequently you're going to have to resort to manual chart review. Uh, you really need to look at what data is actually being regularly documented. You need to figure out what chunks of data that clinicians are doing, are inputting, are going to where. Uh, and you need to understand what 
what data are missing or difficult to extract. Um, by understanding what data are easy uh, are difficult to extract may suggest what data that you, if you know you can't get, perhaps you need to go about the problem in a different way. Some of this chart review may also require actually doing a little bit of analysis of the actual clinical workflow as well to understand what the processes the clinicians are using in order to uh, actually document, um, which may be different from what IT believes their, the system is actually, how the system is actually uh, being used. A lot of times when we do data analytics, we want to do longitudinal data analytics. Uh, so this longitudinal meaning how things change over time. So, or looking at, uh, for example, outcomes with uh, patients uh, with, of a particular condition with a particular treatment, uh, say 10 years down the road, right? And so sometimes uh, we like, you know, we can do that type of analysis, but things to be aware of is that best practices do change over time. Uh, medications and procedures change. Medications come out, and therefore old medications are no longer used. Uh, another challenge that we're running into right now is that uh, there, we've now recently switched to ICD-10 coding, right? So comparing ICD-9 and ICD-10, uh, codes are going to be challenging. Uh, even when there's a crosswalk, we find that they're not quite exactly the same even when they've been crosswalked. Um, also, particularly when you do a longitudinal analysis, for some of us we've had uh, multiple EMR systems or EHR systems, uh, particularly in the recent years. Uh, some of us have gone from best of breed to an integrated system. And comparing data from a previous system to the current one uh, is challenging. Part of it has to do with uh, the knowledge of the data, uh, of the information warehouse specialists and under, inter being able to know uh, what, where the old data came from. Uh, that's just a matter of, um, you know, longevity of, uh, of staff over time. Sometimes there's been turnover and, you know, nobody knows anything about the previous system anymore. Um, that can be a challenge as well. Now, with regards to data integration, uh, what we've found in the past is that there are uh, challenges with regards to integrating data across practice sites because people are using the system differently. Um, there's just some, in some cases, practice variation. Uh, sometimes there are coding uh, differences in terms of how various, uh, you know, ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes are used uh, across sites. Uh, and also sometimes across sites we find that some place, some clinics may put things in the structured uh, field and sometimes it's their best practice to uh, type it into an unstructured data field. Uh, so in some cases when you're pulling your structured data you might find that um, you're just simply missing data from certain clinics, uh, which is uh, something that uh, one has to be aware of. So I've done a little bit of work in terms of heart failure uh, readmissions, uh, particularly with the uh, Medicare uh, pay for performance uh, type uh, changes in recent past. Uh, and what we've attempted to do is to risk stratify patients um, and try to predict uh, who's most likely uh, people to uh, come back for with a readmission. And we've had some challenges with extraction of data uh, that we needed for our, for our analytics. Uh, one of the things that we found uh, surprising was that uh, despite the fact that injection fraction is documented pretty much any time somebody with heart failure comes into the hospital, um, they, uh, we found that this is always documented in the notes, uh, so we've had to do some uh, text processing to extract that information. And also social and family history, uh, which are frequently parameters uh, with regards to heart failure, such as you know whether or not they live alone or if they have a social support at home, uh, that can be a uh, challenge in, in being able to interpret uh, from the electronic health record as well. When doing data analytics, uh, there are some things to, to consider with regards to dates and times. Uh, 
uh, there frequently are many dates to choose from, and it can be really challenging to determine which is the one that you want. Uh, so sometimes you want an admission time. Sometimes uh, you know when you want to know when a, a note was written. Uh, what does that mean when a note was written? When it was uh, when the note was open to start it, or when the note was finalized, which can be actually days apart. Um, with labs, sometimes you want to know what the date, date and time of a lab is, but what's the correct date for the lab? Is it the order date? Is it when the specimen was collected? Uh, is it when the result was reviewed? Uh, sorry, was available or when it was reviewed? All those things are typically recorded in the electronic health record. Uh, so when asking for uh, data, uh, frequently you're going to get questions about which date, which timestamp do you want? Many times we're interested in primary diagnoses of patients. Um, what we found in our work is that um, sometimes there's a primary diagnosis or sometimes it's on a list of diagnoses. Uh, and also we find that diagnoses are not always up to date. Uh, and then especially with problem lists, uh, we found that many of these problems are never removed. So it may have been resolved a long time ago, but uh, the um, you know, when physicians review it the next time, they may choose not to remove it because they don't consider it to be their problem. So um, particularly for you know when there are specialists as well as um, primary care people involved, is that you know a specialist may add a, a specialist you know a, a problem list for, a, a problem to the problem list from their area of a specialty. Uh, and then it may be resolved, and then the you know PCP may not want to remove that problem from the list. Sometimes um, we have found in the workflow is that they may leave something on the problem list just because they want to follow up on it, just just you know even though it's been resolved. And so it's there as a cue for them to to remind them that this was something that was there in the past. So sometimes when we want to look at you know how many patients have a particular diagnosis or problem. Uh, it can be can be challenging, uh, particularly with problems. Now that we've talked a little bit about the data sources uh, and some some needs that we've done there, what are so some of the let's talk a little bit about the computational techniques that we need to need in order to support data analytics. In recent times, there's been a lot of emphasis on natural language processing. Uh, unfortunately, right now, a lot of these NLP engines have been designed and trained on these wire text, uh, but that's being that's changing uh, in recent years. That uh, and that these NLP engines are much more are starting to become uh, more specialized in terms of being able to uh, process clinical text. Another challenge that we find is that data sources are not as clean as traditional research data sources. So, in some cases. Uh, we want to apply a clinic, you know, a research validated uh, predictive model to our electronic health record data, and sometimes data are missing or just um, not as clean, uh, meaning that you know they're just it's hard to identify which is the correct data point um, or things like that, uh, and therefore it can be uh, challenging for um, for for use in the real world. And then also when it comes down to the fundamental basis of data analytics, there's a lot of machine learning and data mining algorithms that have been used. Uh, and that uh, despite the fact that you know, they've been used and tested in other domains, they frequently don't always work uh, in the clinical domain and frequently need to be modified to handle our uh, health data. So because there are a lot of these computational aspects of data analytics, uh, one has to consider uh, the computational resources uh, required for this. And what we've noticed is that you know, this requires frequently increased, increased disk and CPU. Uh, in many cases, also um, faster disk and CPU, uh, you know, sometimes solid state, uh, in order to do some of these data analytics um, projects. And also can frequently require large databases. And uh, it has also required, uh, particularly with unstructured data, processing much larger compute uh, infrastructures. 
Now, something that has been, has been coming up in recent years is the use of the cloud to support this. And uh, computing in the cloud does, in fact, give access to large computational resources on demand. But there are a number of challenges with using that right now. Uh, and I think these will be resolved uh, eventually. Um, but right now, uh, you know, a lot of the challenges are moving data to the cloud. It does uh, require a lot of bandwidth. And a lot of these uh, cloud solutions uh, basically charge on the amount, charge by amount of storage you use. Uh, and therefore, leaving data there uh, can also have a lot of costs associated with it. And lastly, a lot of, a lot of these cloud computing um, organizations are just not used to having to establish uh, HIPAA business associate agreements as of yet. Uh, but I think this will change in the future um, and that, that that process will be a lot easier. <clears throat> now, uh, one of the challenges that we've found uh, is that it's really hard to find the total cost of a patient, particularly when patients could be admitted elsewhere. Uh, and I think this is particularly uh, an issue with, uh, you know, whether or not you're a tertiary care center or a primary care center. Uh, for example, if you have a heart failure patient uh, and, you know, let's say they're transferred to a tertiary care um, facility, uh, it can be you know, it's hard to track down the cost both at the local hospital as well as in the um, specialty hospital. And then from a specialty hospital perspective, uh, frequently they've, you know, people have traveled there. Uh, and therefore, if they were readmitted, they might be readmitted to the local institution. And so tracking all those costs can be really challenging. And unfortunately, uh, these days, a lot of us want to analyze costs. And so that's just a, a difficult thing and, um, to track. Now, all of this leads us into the area of predictive analytics. Um, I think when we get to predictive analytics, it's in some ways the holy grail of what we're trying to achieve with uh, all of this electronic health record infrastructure. Some of this is, uh, you know, we want to get to the point of doing real-time healthcare analytics. Um, right now, a lot of times, uh, you know, decision support is really there to encourage um, best practice in terms of reminding people to consider things like, are people up to date on their vaccinations, right? Um, or, you know, some in some cases, I guess, prevent error prevention. So, you know, we have the wrong number of decimal points in your, uh, in your prescription. Now, we want to get to the point in which we can do things like predictive modeling uh, in, in real time. So when, based on a patient who's come to see me, what's the best uh, treatment uh, for this patient, right? Uh, and unfortunately, right now, most EHR systems are not uh, able to do advanced analytics inside of their, inside the EHR system. And right now, there's basically a need to execute the analytics outside the electronic health record and bring that information back into the EHR for decision for use in decision support. And, you know, we have some issues with uh, predictive analytics because um, right now a lot of work is has been what we would call a homegrown. So, um, you know, you're taking looking at an established model that's out there and then you're trying to implement it in your own institution and do some analysis. Uh, and that frequently in any given time, there's just not enough uh, cases uh, in your own institu institution, institution to generate a robust predictive model. And so therefore, there can be a need to analyze data across large uh, HIEs or you know, across the state. Another challenge is that uh, you know, right now, a lot of people are buying their analytics models from a vendor. Uh, and these analytics models um, you know, have uh, you know, frequently not val have not really been validated before, but on, and probably more challenging is really like, uh, you know, are, are these analytics models really going to be applicable at your hospital uh, because your setting may be different. Um, something that we've also found is that 
uh, particularly within heart failure, uh, just since that's an area I've been familiar with, is that uh, the data we, that we want to do predictive analytics is frequently not in the record uh, and is frequently uh, recorded as, after discharges or would be available after discharge. Uh, in, in terms of heart failure, things like that we would be interested in is interested in our daily weight or blood pressure or heart rate, what are people eating, how are they exercising, uh, whether or not they're taking their meds, and that's just something that we simply don't get in uh, the electronic health record. Uh, maybe perhaps with the quantitized self-movement these days, maybe that's something that will be addressed in the future, um, and whether or not people will be able to uh, record that data uh, and for us to get it at the back of the hospital. Um, that's, you know, with mobile health and uh, home health uh, activities, maybe that this will be something that will, will improve. Now, looking at the future of data analytics, I think I see a lot more work in terms of genomics and personalized medicine being conducted. Um, and I think that will be an interesting area in which uh, a lot of analytics has to be performed and also an increased need for um, um, best, uh, best practice alerts or decision support, just simply because no one can keep track of all the personalized medicine information that's, that's out there. Um, also, uh, I think there's going to be an increased need for customized flow sheets for specialties uh, so that we can actually do data analytics for each one of these subspecialties. I think that we're going to end up needing a lot more disk and computational resources for processing this type of information. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we're going to be having to do a lot more work, uh, you know, transforming data from the HR into easier data structures and into the in data warehouses. Uh, and I think what, you know, if we do appropriate uh, extract, transform, and load uh, processes, we can get data combined into ways that we can uh, uh, understand and be able to have more consistent uh, usages of data and also have defined the data provenance issues. Uh, and then uh, I think it's in some someday we'll w want to be able to mine uh, data across HIEs. I know this happens in some places, um, and that's something that uh, can be challenging right now is just getting access to that, to that data. So probably what uh, is probably most important for this audience is, you know, how is analytics going to change IT and IT organizations and hospitals? I think that we're going to see as I mentioned earlier, larger and larger computational and storage capacity, which uh, while that always happens, I think we're going to move um, into uh, larger and larger computational uh, architectures. Uh, right now, a lot of it is virtualized infrastructure, uh, and that may or may not be appropriate. I think these, this, this is an area that's been very fluid in recent years uh, in terms of whether or not you can do some of this high-performance computing on a virtualized infrastructure, and right now that's the answer is probably not in many cases, but uh, it's possible that uh, as performance increases that, that, that we can maintain virtualized infrastructure, but if that's not the case, then uh, we'll have to have some specialized um, systems administrators who are, uh, who are more used to other alternative uh, computing architectures. Also, uh, uh, as I've been talking about transactional and data warehousing uh, data structures, I think there's going to be an increased movement towards you know data warehousing type data structures, uh, and then I think that uh, we're going to need more and more data scientists, so people who can an, uh, study the data and uh, analyze the data, and not just um, people who are uh, executing queries and retrieving data. I think that uh, there will be more need for people with statistical backgrounds and, uh, and the like. So I've been talking a lot about uh, some of the challenges that we've uh, encountered in uh, data analytics, but you know, I want to, of course, talk about some success stories. Um, you know, one of the really famous ones has been IBM Watson. Uh, and that has been demonstrated to be accurate with utilization management 90% of the time uh, for, I believe it was in, um, in, a, in a cancer um, uh, field. I can't remember specifically what the, what 
what that would apply to. Uh, but it, you know, it, this um, this uh, use of IBM Watson helped uh, health insurers determine which uh, treatments are uh, the most uh, appropriate uh, and most cost effective. Also, uh, Kaiser Permanente has done some work that they were able to uh, identify the frequency of blood clots among people who were prescri prescribed oral contraceptives. Um, and uh, they found a specific uh, formula uh, containing a, uh, a specific drug that increased the likelihood of blood, blood clots by 77% uh, in comparison to other contraceptive formulas. So that's a, that was an interesting result. Um, and then uh, there was another example that I heard about, which was uh, in the Seton healthcare family, uh, which they were able to identify high-risk uh, congestive heart failure patients that were uh, likely to be readmitted by using natural language processing to, ext uh, to extract information out of uh, you know, history and, uh, and physical uh, narratives as well as discharge summaries and among a number of different things. And interestingly enough, they found that uh, the major identifier that they uh, found was that people who were likely to be readmitted actually lacked emotional support and uh, frequently had a bul bulging jugular vein. Uh, and they identified those as their high risk predictors. And at this point, uh, I can take some questions. All right, pulling up our questions right now, it doesn't appear that we have any questions, Dr. Lai. Okay. Well, first, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to personally thank you for uh, providing us with this webinar today. For those that are uh, attending, Dr. Lai also serves at, as the sponsor, I'm sorry, as the scholarship chair for the CSO HIMS uh, board. Um, does a great job. Oh, you know what? We just had a question come in. Master Patient Index, MRN versus Compound. So let's uh, expand maybe on this and say what, you know, what, what are you seeing as a trend in Master Patient Index? What is the discussion and what are the benefits? Um, I mean, certainly I think we would all love a Master Patient Index. I think particularly, you know, would there be a, um, you know, universal patient ID? That would be fantastic, although I don't know where we're going to see that. Um, but, uh, I mean, certainly being able to um, have a definitive identifier for people would be, would make data analytics much easier. Another question came in. Um, no? Do you see data, in, data analytics as a, Good choice for college students, i.e., the wave of the future. Uh, actually, I believe yes. Right now, uh, you know, things change from time to time, but right now, I think there's a a strong uh, gap in terms of the skill sets uh, that people need for data analytics and the supply of those people who have those skill sets. Um, I think that particularly when we talk about data analytics, I think there's a. Uh, I know that. Um, there's been a number of institutions around the country that are launching data analytics degree programs. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, you know, a lot of these programs have in common is that they have a strong fundamental basis in computer science, uh, but also statistics. Um, and then in many cases, people subspecialize into a particular domain. And I think uh, uh, having people with that right balance of skill sets with regards to uh, understanding um, you know, data, how it's processed, how it's stored, and what the appropriate statistical methods are, uh, which is, you know, a little bit different from biostaticians, biostatisticians who are frequently more in the process of, uh, you know, an analysis of the data. But I think there's a whole pipeline of things that need to be understood there that uh, I think uh, people who are getting training in uh, specifically data analytics and then uh, subspecializing into perhaps clinical analytics uh, will be, will be uh, having jobs uh, for quite some time, I think, uh, as data becomes available. Okay, next question is, what skills does a di data scientist have that an analyst does not? Uh, I would say that I somewhat addressed that in my previous answer in terms of 
Uh, you know, certainly many times a analyst have, may have some computational background, uh, particularly with regards to programming or uh, SQL uh, query generation. But um, I think that a lot of data analytics, uh, uh, data scientists uh, are, you know, have to have an understanding of you know algorithms and statistical methods uh, that are used uh, in the analysis of that data. Okay, next question is, what consulting companies in Ohio would you recommend to help support these efforts? As an academic, I, I am actually not aware of any particular uh, consulting companies. Okay, in discussing the problem list as a data issue, still a problem uh, or is the problem resolved, is there a recommendation on dealing with this sort of issue or is there just or is it just to be noted as an area that is difficult to uh, deal with? I would say it's just it's primarily a an area that's to be noted as an uh, as an area that is could be challenging. Although it doesn't say that you can't use it as a data source, you just need to be aware of the semantics of the use of that data. So just knowing that uh, you know because it's on a problem doesn't necessarily mean it's actually there. Um, I don't know if there's a good way to address that because of. Uh, uh, because of clinical vari clinical practice variability, right? So um, I think that you know at the major issue in data analytics is not that you can't get to the data. I think the man uh, the bigger issue is really understanding how to use it and also understanding the context in which the data was collected and how people are using that data in the clinic. So all problems would be solved if we just had a. Uh you know, a, a single patient identifier and a single set of uh, coding. All things would be good in the field of data analytics. Uh, that would be nice, although uh, that still doesn't, that still leaves out the challenges that we encounter with uh, with how people actually use systems, right? So, uh, you know, we, we would love to have a master, master patient index uh, or, you know, a nas you know, national identifier uh, and, uh, you know, certainly, let's say everybody was inputting data in a structured data fields, which we would all love. Uh, but uh, I think there's still challenges in terms of, you know, how do people put things in? How do people interpret data when they're inputting it those in the like? So, yeah, somebody uh, kind of put in a comment rather than a question about. Um, um, there was an earlier question about organizations in Ohio that kind of work in this field. This person recommended Battelle. Uh, as a, an Ohio company with strong data analytic capabilities, and they are actually part of a presentation at him. So, if you look for a case study including the acute kidney injury project that Dr. Lai mentioned, will be presented at HIMS National uh, on March first at four p.m. Oh, well, that's great! I had no idea they were presenting that. I will try to attend that session. Are there existing mathematical models for clinical analytics that are available publicly? A lot of these models that exist that are out there that are, have been published are relatively simplistic in terms of um, there are you know frequently fairly simple simple formulas that have been deduced to to you know uh, risk stratify people based on clinical data, but I think with regards to data analytics, things tend to be, we tend to be looking at much more complicated um, um, uh, data and much more, much larger data points. Uh, and typically in, a, in an institution, one is going to be looking at, uh, you know, trying to identify trends in your own data, which is a little bit different from just applying some known, uh, some known uh, measures. Do you see problems with data visualizations of clinical cohorts presented as de-identified given the HHS HIPAA rules at, of state level aggregation or zip codes with less than 20,000? That can be an issue, although I would say that with regards to many of the data analytics applications that we're talking about, there's they're being done for the purposes of quality improvement and also with regards to uh, use in clinical care. Uh, particularly, I think in those cases, I'm not sure that, that, that those challenges really apply in that case because that information is certainly not leaving the covered entity, uh, specifically in those visualizations, uh, as well as um, I think it's entirely it's considered to be entirely appropriate to be doing uh, 
analytics uh, for the purposes of quality improvement. Can you comment on the coming access by individuals to records on an HIE for review purposes? I think this person may be even asking about, you know, uh, uh, the ability to access HIE level data for analytics pop and population health. Okay. Um, that would be great. I mean, if we can actually access individual information uh, across an HIE for population health and analytics, uh, I think that would be excellent. Uh, you know, certainly I think that would help in terms of understanding across a the you know patient's uh, entire care continuum, uh, you know what happens to individual patients, and also being able to aggregate that into uh, uh, larger and larger models, uh, particularly because uh, you know even the largest healthcare systems, you know, with the exception of a few very large conglomerates, have enough data for you know really statistically significant results in terms of uh, an, you know doing performing data analytics. Uh, within individual patient populations, and uh, you know, once you slice and dice a patient population down, uh, you may have a million records in your EHR, but frequently you end up with a uh, you know a couple thousand or you know a hundred patients with a particular diagnosis that you're interested in. Uh, so being able to do that across the state would be fantastic, and you might be able to get numbers large enough to do um, to do quite amazing analytics. That appears to wrap up all of our questions. Again, Dr. Lai, thank you so much. Uh, for our attendees, the slides are available from within the app, uh, from within the GoToWebinar app right now. They will be up on the CSM's website here within the next couple days. Um, if you do have any additional questions for Dr. Lai, um, you can just email the csohio.info info at hymnschapter.org, and we'll make sure Dr. Light gets that message. So, again, thank you to all of our attendees and to our presenter. And have a good day.